Henry, Minister of Labour et al. within the Federal Cabinet and Premier of Nevis, and in particular, Minister with responsibility for the police over on the island of Nevis, Mr. Gosai, Arun Gosai, the Director of Public Prosecutions Acting, Mr. Osman Petty, the Permanent Secretary within the Ministry of National Security, Mrs. Josephine Malalu Webb, the Senior Magistrate, Mrs. Janine Harris Lake, Registrar of the Supreme Court, Mr. Stafford W. Liburd, Commissioner of Police, have Force Chaplain, Pastor Leroy Benjamin, Force Personnel, Mr. Clifford Gavire, Gazetted Officers, Members of Her Majesty's Customs. We have Mr. Basil Wilson and the facilitators from Monroe College, representatives from SCASPA, representatives from the Ministry of Education. We also have members of the Criminal Justice Strategic Board that was recently launched. We have also members from the Social Services Department, Probation and Child Protection Services as well, partners from uh, Was University and Windsor University, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to this, our the first of what I believe would be a series of ongoing training with the Monroe College out of the U.S. My greetings are in the book already, and I, I saw I would not bore you in going through them. But I believe that our nation is at a critical juncture, and we need all hands on deck. And as such, we have put together this workshop, which is geared at bringing all the stakeholders together so that we can devise strategies which are geared towards reducing homicides, violent crimes, and in particular, the fear of crime within our community. I must say that the task that I undertook was thrusted upon me. I remember vividly walking into the commissioner's office one day just to um, hand something to him. And um, I was told, come here, man. I'm going to put you in something right now. And with that, he gave me the phone. On the other end of the phone was Ms. Kimara Isaac, who is the special projects coordinator at the Monroe College in New York. And Kimara, being a native of this federation, wanting to give back something to our country, we started a discussion. Initially, this workshop should have lasted three hours. But then I had to journey to New York, and after meeting with the vice president of the college and the other executives, um, the dean of the faculty of criminal justice and others, it was decided that this workshop would have to take a whole day. And so, out of that, you would have seen a team of renowned professors. And in our midst, there is a judge and, um, from New York, and he will speak to you some more later. And this team that was put together, I believe, aptly represents the direction in which we are trying to go, and a wealth of knowledge and experience, both from the field, academia, and um, the legal standpoint. And so, I want to welcome you to this forum today. And I would hope that we would be as engaging as we can and draw out from the professors the experiences and the wealth of their knowledge. So with those few words, I will now invite Ms. Kimara Isaac, Special Projects Coordinator to the Vice President of Monroe College to say a few words. Ms. Isaac. I will not tell you how happy I am to be here, so I won't even begin to explain. 
But what I like to do is let you guys know that I am, even though I live in New York, I'm fully committed to assisting the people and the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. In doing so, I am so much available to them that I have taken it upon myself to ask the institution that I work for, Monroe College, convince the Vice President to send down an entire team to do such an event. It's my esteemed pleasure to be here again. You're present. I cannot begin to tell you how happy I am to be in your present. I know today's activities and the material that you're going to get would be so beneficial, useful, and relevant to today's issues that you're facing. And if there's anything, feel free to see me after the session. If there's anything else in the future that you guys may need, I am here to serve you. And that's all I say. Uh, my bio is in the back. Mr. Queeley said a little bit about um, what I do at Monroe College, but I'll tell you a little bit more um, in a little bit. Um, and that's basically how I want you guys to um, view me. So in this current capacity to the Executive Vice President, I manage scholarship agreements. I work with several ministries of education throughout the Caribbean, namely Bahamas, Antigua, Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, of course, and Antigua. And what I do is basically make sure that their interest at the college is kept and they have close communication with the government and the vice president so they can work together as a team. There are very often um, times where students feel the need to get further assistance, they need further training, they need different resources, and they don't readily have that available to them, and I am there to accommodate that. All right? If you look in your uh, books, you will not see this name, but I want to invite him to the podium to say a few words, and that is my very hard-working PS. He cannot come here and do say anything. So I would ask the PS to bring welcome where I should bring welcome. The PS will say a few words. PS Petty. Thank you, ACP Quealy. Over the last two weeks, we have had two very important events which, to my mind, lead into this workshop. First, we had a UNDP-sponsored one-day seminar, intensive seminar here on advancing citizen security. And some of you were involved in that where many stakeholders, students, including students, came here and brainstormed a number of activities which could inform an agenda for St. Kitts and Nevis as we try to improve the security situation in this country, including matters relating to criminal justice. And then just last week, on the 11th of November, we launched here in St. Kitts, and I understand the first in the OECS, the Criminal Justice Strategic Board, which is to be chaired by the Honorable Attorney General. And the purpose of this board will be to brainstorm ways of improving the situation in St. Kitts and Nevis so that people can live, work, study, do business in the country, and to identify strategies that will work towards improving criminal justice practices in the country. And they will be doing this over the next few months and years as we proceed with this present government. So I'm sure that this workshop will lend some insight and direction to the Criminal Justice Strategic Board as it elaborates its own agenda for the next few months and years. Some of the issues which have been emerging over the last few months and years for that matter, but since I've been permanent secretary include delays in cases being brought to the court for trial, reoffending and recidivism among prisoners who have been released, rehabilitation of prisoners, We've also had concern with juvenile justice, youth justice, and how to deal with the juvenile offenders. Issues of parole for prisoners. Why, when, and who should get that parole? Of course, we are always concerned about the rising crime, violent crime, and ways of reducing such crime. Community engagement, and the big one, witness protection. 
there are only about four countries in the Caribbean region that has any semblance of an effective witness protection program. And this is a challenge to us here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And so we hope that during the course of today we can discuss expanding in, the expanding importance of forensics and generally an increasing role for the use of technology in the provision of evidence so that there is less dependence on witness protection. Not that eyewitnesses are not important, but we have to find ways when they're not available, other means of providing the evidence. In about two weeks, before, uh, hopefully by the end of this month, we shall be distributing the Royal St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force strategic plan for the next three years, 2015, 2018, and an improved service delivery plan for the police force. We've been working on this over the last few months, and accountability will be a major factor, an important key, work, key action word going forward. But in that plan, there are going to be four key organizational changes one will be an inspectorate led by the, de the Deputy Commissioner of Police, which will look at professional standards and training of police officers, among other things, but professional standards across the board is going to be important. There will be a crime directorate, which we have an, op an operations directorate, and we will, we will be introducing a new directorate, which we'll call Administration, Resources, and Technology. All of these will be led by an ACP. And so we hope that with these initiatives, along with whatever we get from workshops such as these, they would lead to an improved professionalism or professionalizing of the police force. And even as at another level, we look for accreditation of the Royal St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force with the RSS in Barbados all of the things that we're going to be discussing at these meetings and many of the reforms which we have planned for the police would all lead to an improved police force and an improved criminal justice system in general. Thank you very much, um, PS. And that, that is the power of the chair. Um, I saw the PS come this morning and said, you're not on the program, but you have to talk. So um, putting him on the spot and delivering as capable as he is. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierce, for that. Next on the agenda, I will call to the podium Mr. Basil Wilson, um, who will be the lead facilitator, and he will give a brief overview of what should transpire today, and he would give also an introduction of his team. I must commend all those who were responsible for putting this conference slash workshops together. One of the things that we know about the field of criminal justice is that it is comprised of a multiplicity of components. And often in both developed countries and developing countries, these components do not connect with each other. And that can create a certain level of dysfunctionalism. Uh, and so I commend the people of St. Kitts, the government of St. Kitts, um, for really bringing all the stakeholders together in one room where one can really look at the system in a way in which one can move forward to bring a higher level of security to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. One of the things that I want to do in the overview is to really look at these issues from a comparative perspective. Um, many of you in this room are, in fact, the experts on what goes on in St. Kitts and Nevis. But one of the things that we know in the field of criminal justice is that we benefit immensely from looking at what is happening in other countries and how other countries are, in fact, dealing with some of the critical issues that we face in the region. And it brings about certain critical research questions that I think is helpful to St. Kitts and Nevis in terms of tackling the problems of violent crime within this society. 
Take, for example, if you look at the um, homicide report put out by the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, you find that the Caribbean region is disproportionately represented in terms of levels of homicide per 100,000. And what is fascinating in looking at that list, and it's available in the, on the internet, when you look at what are the countries that have the least homicide rates, that is also terribly fascinating. And let me sort of give you an example of this. Honduras, which is in Central America, has the highest homicide rate in the world. It's about 91 per 100,000. Immediately after that, it is El Salvador, with about 69 per 100,000. And what is fascinating in looking at Central America, Nicaragua, which has the same level of economy, same historical development as the other Central American countries, does not have the level of homicides that we find afflicting Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. So the research question is, what is happening in Nicaragua? Why Nicaragua has been able to avoid that kind of overflowing of um, violent crime, which has um, been plaguing um, some of the other Central American questions. Another very important research question is that when you look at a country like Trinidad and Tobago, which has immense resources in terms of economic development, economic growth, Yet still violent crime homicide rates skyrocketed at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, it got out of hand by the time you got to 2007, 2008. It has gone back down somewhat. And you have a similar kind of escalation in a country like Jamaica. And when you compare those two countries with Barbados, in the same region, same colonial history, Barbados has remained quite level in terms of homicide rates for quite some time. So the critical question is what has been happening in certain Caribbean countries, why violent crime has escalated, while in other societies the crime has in fact been going down. So we need to learn in terms of best practices from those countries and how we can in fact make adjustments to what is going on in the respective societies so that we can have a much better handle in terms of providing security to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, I think when the permanent secretary was speaking, he mentioned the Human Development Report, which apparently had a workshop here um, a week or two ago. And that's really a fascinating report, which I think came out in 2012, and which sort of looked at the region. They really focused on seven countries of the region. St. Kitts and Nevis was not one of them, but there were other Eastern Caribbean countries like Barbados and St. Lucia who were included in the, um, in the meticulous analysis that were done. And they used the term, which the PS used, citizen security. And there's an interesting development that has emerged in terms of criminal justice in recent years. And I just want to briefly put that out there because I think that sort of frames much of what we're doing. There's no question that there has been a revolution in policing in the last 25, 30 years. And in many respects, New York City, where crime was falling apart in the 70s and the 80s and even early 90s, there has been what we call the New York miracle. And I'll give you just a, a, an example of that in terms of homicide rates. In 1990, New York City had 2,000 262 homicides. And in 2014, there were 328. So you have had this massive decline in major crimes in New York City, and certainly the members of NYPD, which a few retired NYPD members are here, and if you spoke to Ray Kelly, they will argue that it had to do with this revolutionary policing what I call scientific policing that was introduced by um, Commissioner Bratton. I think it's a little more complex. I think it has to do definitely with the role that um, policing played, but also in other critical um, changes that were taking place in the larger society. I won't go, go into that, 
but it is a, a fascinating study to look at how New York City, that was really falling apart in the 70s and the 80s, affected by the epidemic, has become a fairly civilized place now in terms of low crime rates. And maybe we should give some applause to the former members of NYPD who have been instrumental in bringing that about. But one of the other research thrusts that has been taking place in criminal justice is the whole business of not just what goes on in policing, but in terms of the dynamics taking place in the larger society. And in fact, the Human Development Report paid a lot of attention to that. And there's a whole literature in terms of criminal justice that focuses on the significance of human capital, what is called social capital or community efficacy, and how that contributes to the negation of escalations of violence, how that contributes to the wholesomeness of, um, a, 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 of a society. And it's quite appropriate that you have many stakeholders in this room who are in fact linked to child services, to domestic violence, to um, the, the, the state of the family, which are in critical in understanding whether or not a society can really effectively move forward, not just in terms of effective policing, but in terms of enhancing the, um, the kind of security, which is critical to the whole economic developmental process that we are facing in the region. As we move along, I will now invite to the podium, um, sitting in, deputizing, whatever word we want to use for the Honorable Attorney General, is the acting DPP, Mr. Gosai, and he would bring to us some brief remarks. Mr. Gosai. Um, let me just issue a disclaimer. I am not standing in place of the Attorney General. We have independent offices, but I apologize for his absence. We have a very good working relationship, independent of each other. Now, I must commend ACP Quilly and the officers of the Royal St. Christopher Nevis Police Force and, the, and Ms. Isaac from Monroe College in New York for putting together, I had it as workshop, but having looked at the booklet, I realized it will be several workshops. That these workshops come at a very important time in the Federation's history. It comes at a time when the nation is facing the most difficult task of trying to recapture our communities from the stranglehold of those who make it their business to engage in crime and violence. And I have heard it over and over, and a few days ago, at the opening of another set of workshops, a two-week workshop that is ongoing in the Federation in terms of investigation of crimes, I echoed the words that we have to work together. It cannot be done by the police alone, by the government alone, by the Justice Department alone. It affects all of us, and so we have to work together. And so the bringing together of all the various facets of the society together in one room, and that we're not just going to stay here, absorb what we have to absorb, and go back to business as normal. We have to work together to fight crime. Mr. Wilson made mention, he was giving examples, and I want to just give the example of St. Kitts and Antigua, statistics which I only learned a few days ago. That in Antigua with a population of 90,000, almost twice the size of St. Kitts and Nevis, the homicide rate to date is five. Actually, when one of the officers who is engaged in St. Kitts in that workshop that I mentioned, when he said five, I turned to the person next to me and said, did he say five? Because we have, in the Federation, as of today's date, 25. And so there must be something that is wrong, something that, is, that we're not doing right, or something that we can do right, but we're not doing it right. Given the nature of the workshop as well, the timeliness is, is, is quite important, because it speaks to justice in the community and law enforcement in the community. And quite recently, we will know that there have been three shootings by the police in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. And so 
while the, the public, most of them, were out to get the neck of the police, I believe that that is an eye-opener to show that we have to work together and we have to stop the blame game that is ongoing in the Federation, that crime under the previous government was X and crime under this government, which has been only in eight or nine months, is X. It's not going to help us. And so we have to work together. We have to stop that. Echo the words of the motto, country above self. Echo the words of the national anthem, as stalwarts we stand for justice and liberty. You sing the anthem lustily, it comes from your heart. Act the words of it. And so, before I close, I must say I was going through my news this morning and I realized ISIS, while they have been in Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, three persons were arrested in Haiti. So crime fighting is becoming a global fight. And it's only a matter of time before ISIS and other lead global criminal organizations infiltrate communities that are prone to crime and violence. So I, with those words, I wish everyone a successful day. And I hope whatever we learn, we just echo the words of the anthem and the motto. Let us stand together and recapture St. Kitts and Nevis from the stranglehold of crime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. DPP. I think you uh, put it very nicely. I will now call on the senior minister and honorable premier to give his address and officially declare this workshop open. Honorable Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Keely. And permit me to recognize the permanent secretary in the Ministry of National Security and other senior civil servants, members of the head table, Mr. Gosai, Ms. Isaac, Mr. Wilson, and the force chaplain and the acting commissioner of police, Mr. Leibard, and the presenters from the faculty of the Monroe College. I want to advise you that I shall be mercifully brief because I do not know that I could add much to what has been said before. And to take my cue from the DPP because I think the issue of dealing with crime and criminal activity in our country, St. Kitts and Nevis, and maybe the entire region, has to do with our getting to the root causes. But that is a much longer term solution. And here in St. Kitts, as I speak on behalf of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. The government is seeking to put in place a number of initiatives, a number of new programs dealing with the matter of fighting crime, the police six-point plan, the introduction of technology to assist the police in the fight against crime, looking at ways of upgrading the quality of training for the police force, insisting that there is that closer collaboration between the arms of the criminal justice system, that is the police, the prosecution, the courts, to make sure that there is that harmony existing among those arms of the criminal justice system. And you would have heard of the newly established Criminal Justice Strategic Board, which goes to the heart of what we must do immediately to come to grips with the difficult challenge which we have been faced with. That is, how do we curb, eradicate, reduce the incidence of serious crimes in our country. I think it is imperative that all of the stakeholders represented here today in this workshop or these series of workshops recognize that there is that interdependence of duty and function 
which requires that while the government has a responsibility for providing the infrastructure, providing the resources, hiring the manpower to engage in the head-on fight against crime and the prosecution of crime and so on, that there are other avenues which will help to assist in the solution of the problem which we are now facing. And one of the challenges we have is how do we get our people in community, even though we admit that with serious crime and with the threat which we perceive or which exists to our citizens, how do we get ourselves to break free from that fear so that we can address the difficulties which exist, that is, get people in the community to become part of the process of crime fighting, of crime reduction, of ensuring that we restore our country, our communities, to a state of stability, ensure that there's security in our homes, in our business places, and on our streets. Because I've come to the conclusion that when we speak as representatives of government, even though we're representing the people, they don't want to take us seriously because they want to construe what we say as being for some political advantage or some political gain. When the police speak or the police takes action, there is that element. We don't trust the police. The police are engaging in activities which they don't like. So there's that negative connotation which is applied to those in authority who are seeking to give the leadership in the fight against crime to restore the stability, the security, and the harmonious state which we would like to have to enjoy. The DPP has made a challenge to us, given a conclusive challenge to us, that we need to take our country out of the stranglehold of the criminals and those who may not commit violent crime, but who are engaging in antisocial behavior, whether it is in the school, in the community generally, whether it is in our homes, because sometimes in our homes we have the beginnings or the manifestation of antisocial behavior. There was mention of domestic violence and so on, child abuse. And we tend, unfortunately, in large measure to turn a blind eye or to condone by our lack of wanting to take action or to do something or to say something so that we can deal with those ills in our society which can become and which may have been the bedrock or the breeding ground of our criminal activity which is now facing us and which we are now seeking to address and to overcome. I think the government clearly has that responsibility to ensure we have the police properly trained, properly resourced, that we have adequate magistracy, that we provide the judges and the prosecutorial arm to deal with the matter once the criminal activity has been committed. But I want us to begin to look more at how do we foster a culture of zero tolerance, seeking to change attitudes, to create a positive outlook on ourselves individually and our community. Because I, I want to aver that in this room, those of us who are here, uh, we have in some degree a sphere of influence. 
not necessarily just in our homes, but also elsewhere. And if we can, through our sphere of influence, spread the word that we are really eating ourselves from the inside as a community, and that we need to develop more positive attitudes and also more community-spirited attitudes, we may begin to see a reduction in crime. We may begin to see greatest number of crimes solved because information will be coming forth because people then would have decided, I am no longer going to live in fear. Because I've recognized that when you live in fear, you get yourselves backed against a wall, there's nowhere else to go. And I am entreating us today as a leader in this country and one who has had over the years and will continue to have a serious zero tolerance to any criminal activity that we must not allow ourselves to be backed into that wall, into that corner from which there is no escape. We held a conference in St. Lucia which also brought together stakeholders and I think it was very enriching to the, um, to the people of St. Lucia. In fact, I must commend the executive vice president of Monroe College, Mark Jerome, who has been very instrumental in establishing these relationships with the people of St. Kitts, providing certain kinds of scholarships and opportunity to develop expertise in respective fields. And so this year, the focus is on criminal justice. And so we brought together many of the people who are professors in the um, College of Criminal Justice and who have had extensive experience working with the New York Police Department, with the federal government, to really engage in a dialogue with the people who are on the ground, with the boots on the ground, in St. Kitts, dealing with these day-to-day -day problems. Are we discussing gang activities here in the island, as well as how we deal with confidential informants? Confidential informants are individuals who agree to work in partnership with law enforcement to try to cease and desist criminal activity on the island. Gangs is all a major problem, not just here in St. Kitts, but around the world. And I've had a, a, a great deal of experience in that capacity trying to persuade uh, juvenile delinquents to avoid gang activity and trying to help them possibly get out of the gang activity and what it would entail. Gang activity is a short-lived lifestyle. It doesn't last forever. There is no future in it. There's other opportunities and doors that are open to anyone who simply wants to change the quality of their life and establish a new legacy for themselves their family and their community at large. I'm particularly pleased to see such a multi-agency approach taking place within St. Kitts because my experience is that policing isn't an art to be performed by yourselves. It needs the cooperation of many different agencies and of course the community to make a difference. So this conference today I think is particularly visionary by the police service here in St. Christopher and Nevis and by the governments as well. I'm looking forward to the debates, the involvement of everybody present and the outcomes that come from these workshops. My intention is to listen a lot, to see what other agencies have got to contribute, see what their viewpoints are, see what their strategic direction is and see if I could introduce some of the concepts that we've successfully used in the UK to tackle gang crime and bring about a reduction in homicide we're particularly envious that we have, uh, we enjoy a very successful detection rate for homicide. Our communities cooperate very well, but it's not without its challenges. And some of the lessons we'll hear in this conference will be very important for ourselves, as with colleagues locally in the Caribbean. My name is Keith Singer. I'm a retired lieutenant commander from the NYPD. And today what I want to be discussing is, I'm going to be discussing the ComStat system, which is short for Computer Statistics in New York City and how it relates to the uh, St. Kitts Nevis Police Department's six-point plan and how together by combining CompStat and the six-point plan, how one, you could reduce crime, uh, one, you can uh, make accountability more important, and thirdly, you can increase leadership by combining the two.